Thank you, Maddie, for um, joining us today to present this pretty impressive Python paper for spatial transcriptomics. Hi, all. So I'll be presenting uh, SquidPy today. Uh, I presented this a couple of days back in Spatial Journal Club. So I'm not sure who all were there, but it would be a reputation for who are there. Uh, SquidPy is an open source Python framework, which combines a common set of tools used for uh, spatial omics analysis and visualization. It is built on top of ScanPy uh, and data package image, Napari, task and several other scientific computing libraries in Python. Uh, it also comes, uh, so it also does single cell uh, analysis and it has abilities to integrate other single cell analysis packages uh, into the software. So this table here shows a comparison of different softwares that's doing the spatial omics analysis and it, they show like, uh, why there's a need uh, for a software like SquidPy since like most of the softwares that are currently available either do the gene expression analysis or the imaging based analysis and there's no one software which can combine both and also has interactive visualization of these analysis software. Uh, I added these two columns here, one for space in the library and Mr. Six, since these are the two like uh, most used softwares. Uh, for our in-house data for spatial omics experiments. And I'm not entirely sure if I did the right job here. Yeah, so the main motivation of this software is to build an integrated package we can, which can do everything and also uh, support uh, addition of other softwares like uh, Tangram, Cell Profiler, TensorFlow, which is used uh, for these kinds of analysis. This table shows a comparison of SquidPy versus Gerto, which they think is a direct competitor for them, since like Gerto is the only software right now in Python that does single cell and spatial analysis, but it does not have capability for image analysis. That's what uh, is shown in red here. What are the things missing on SquidPy? Simulation of spatial data. So expression correlation, I'm not sure what this is. Uh, uh, LR pairing is like different kinds of cell-cell interactions. It has some of that analysis uh, based on the cell type annotations from the gene expression, but seems like not really from the images, like, uh, like analysis that can be done uh, from image features, I guess. So it seems like SquidPy's main ability is to integrate the image analysis into the, with the gene expression analysis. Uh, this, this figure on left shows its uh, workflow where uh, here it shows the different kinds of data that it supports and it builds a spatial graph from all these kinds of data. I'll explain what the spatial graph is and they use the image container object to store these high resolution images. And then they have different uh, modules to perform the image processing and visualize that along with the analysis software, both for gene expression and the data extracted from images. Both of these data can be integrated and visualized using the Napari software. So spatial graph is nothing but when we uh, like, for example, if we take a uh, museum data, uh, each spot, like we perform analysis for museum data by spot, like, so each spot in museum is considered as a node, and then they build a uh, graph where like, uh, it extracts its, 
it extracts relationship of a given spot to its neighboring spot based on different distance functions. Uh, like this hexagonal structure is mainly for Visium and the square based is from a slight, slight seat. So for these uh, platforms, uh, every spot is considered as a node. For other uh, imaging uh, platforms, every cell is considered as a node and its relation with other neighboring cells is extracted based on different metrics like here and they perform analysis based on those metrics. And all these different uh, distance calculations are considered as spatial graphs for that particular data set. Figures B through K on the right side shows like different, different types of analysis packages that's included in SquidPy and how they represent the data. So figure, here figure B shows uh, cluster pairs uh, from, from SeekFish data using this uh, spatial graph method. It's called telling, telling, telling. So they claim that uh, clusters like lateral, lateral plate mesoderm L and L and Ellen ties are uh, like they they claim that those are the cluster pairs that they extracted from the neighborhood enrichment analysis module they have and they can visually see that here on the section like the lateral plate mesoderm is the green cluster here and the Ellen ties is the blue one so this blue cluster. Figure D shows a 3D visualization of Murfish data and the similar kind of uh, neighborhood enrichment analysis on this data is shown in figure E here. And figure F shows molecular profiles of Gila data. So I'm not completely sure about this data like we don't do any kind of this imaging in-house but then uh, they do they have this co-occurrence score uh, co-occurrence measure uh, analysis module which using that they saw that uh, So they see uh, cluster nucleolus is highly uh, it's highly co-occurred with the nucleus and the nuclear envelope clusters. So this blue line here is the nucleolus, and when they perform the co-occurrence analysis on that cluster, they see these two other clusters co-occurring with that cluster among all other cell types. These two other colors. Figure H shows uh, slide seek data with different cell type annotations and we perform uh, again the cluster co-occurrence analysis and the please uh, as L statistic. Here this shows the cluster co-occurrence analysis on this data set. They see that I can't remember which clusters it is, like the name, but it's the purple and the brown cluster here. Like from their analysis, they show that they too are highly co-occurred in this data set using the co-occurrence analysis module and using the replace L statistic, they say that the pyramidal layer and the dentate gyrus layer, like the cell, uh, clusters are more like the cell type, these cell types are more clustered compared to other different cell types which are more dispersed or random in the data set. And figure K shows uh, the three uh, spatially variable, highly spatially variable genes that they extracted from this data set 
using uh, the using Moran's I spatial autocorrelation analysis module that they have. Um, yeah, like it, this is the summary of how their workflow goes and how uh, the different types of analysis modules they have for different types of data set. Uh, this figure shows uh, uh, Squidpies image analysis and feature integration, like image feature, feature integration with the gene expression data. So this shows the schematic of the image processing workflow, like they take in the image, do some processing, ex like segment the image and then extract related features from the image. And these features are then integrated into uh, integrated with the gene ex gene expression uh, matrix and then data object, and that's that can be viewed interactively with Napari or uh, Squidpy. Also has functions that can plot them directly. And these are the different types of features that can be extracted from the images right now in Squidpy. Summary features are nothing but like the summary of spots or cell, summary of intensity of the spots or cells in the image. Histogram feature, features is nothing but uh, histogram bin counts per spot or cell. Text of, texture features are a variation of intensity across the spots or cells in the image. And segmentation features are number of nuclei per spot, size of nuclei per spot, and number of nuclei per image if it's other type of other types of imaging modalities. Custom features are nothing but like you can integrate other machine learning uh, packages with SketPy, which extracts other features from the images. And that uh, all these features can be extracted as observations versus features matrix, which can be uh, combined with observation versus genes, uh, gene expression matrix and then you can perform any downstream analysis. So figures B through F here shows different analysis modules, modules uh, that they apply to different kinds of data sets. So figure B here shows visium uh, mouse brain image from 10X spatial data set and it has three channels, DAPI, anti neuron and anti-GFAP. So these are insets of the whole image. And uh, these are the nuclear segmentations from DAPI uh, using their inbuilt watershed algorithm. So using, uh, using the features like a uh, number of nuclei per spot from DAPI segmentation and if they plot those features, they say that like the pyramidal layer can be easily distinguished from other uh, regions in the image, which which is an important uh, image feature. And then the violin plots here show. Uh, the GF, uh, GFAP expression uh, in low intensity versus high intensity spots in anti GFAP channel. Like uh, low intensity spot, the spots are uh, tagged as low intensity or high intensity based on the median intensity. Like they take median intensity as threshold and spots which have higher than median in intensity are labeled as high expressing GFAP spots in that channel. And they see uh, clear differences between those spots. And similarly for the gene RB Fox3, which is known to be anti, like related to the anti nuan uh, gene channel. Like they say, like these spots, which are considered as high expressing anti nuan, are also 
uh, having high expression of RB Fox three versus the low. Figure F shows a bit of uh, image. It's a multiplex ion beam imaging by time of flight. Uh, I'm not completely sure what that imaging method is. We don't use that in house, but then like it's a publicly available data set. This is the raw image and these are the cell segmentations available with the raw image. They extract the mean intensity per cell uh, in the C CD4-5 gene channel and CK uh, gene channel. So with this image metric, they get, they show that they easily classified the uh, cell type like here and here. About like um I guess like D mm -hmm. and then E. Is there, they're saying that they can pair like the fluorescence data and like figure out. Uh, high GFIP, low GFIP, like versus, uh, I guess, like these other genes that weren't in their fluorescence data. Is that I, like the the logic there? Like they kind of know what neurons are in which spots? Um, or is this like totally separate analysis? Or? I think they are trying to say that like uh, spots that express anti GF should also be expressing GFAP. Okay. So that's why they see like high expressing anti GFAP spots have high expression of GFAP versus. So like in D, right, you're looking at, you're processing the, the fluorescence image, which is based on uh, protein markers. Yeah. Right. Um, um, so, so it's based on the protein marker, plus you go through all this image processing right, to like try to remove background stuff. Now you find like which cells, I mean, I might describe that like, you look at the median and then just say like, the, the ones that have above median intensity are like um, have GAP, the other ones are like low in GAP. And then in E, they look at the top version of E, they look at the actual expression of measuring those spots. Uh, for that gene, GFP, and then they say like, oh, look, it makes sense, right? Okay. Uh, there's higher expression on the um, spots that had high intensity of the, uh, of the fluorescence data, right? Okay. Um, then the bottom one there is like, at that point now they're looking at two genes, right? A gene that they expect to see expressed in, in neurons, um, which is not the new engine. Uh, um, right. Um, I think that's what you said, right? It's a bit, yeah. I can't really see, but, um, yeah, yeah. But you can imagine that they could have used like, I don't know, SNAP25, which is a, yeah. a gene that is expressed in neurons and then show that like, Hey, like that gene has higher expression in the spots that had, um, higher intensity for the new one antibody. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and like that might not always be the case because yeah. like um, some proteins can last a long time um, compared to others, right? And so you can imagine a cell that like made messenger RNAs, translating those mRNAs into proteins, and then they stay in the cell for a long time. But then it says like, hey, I don't want to keep making this stuff. And so then it stops mRNA production, right? So that could happen. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, plus like there's a whole set of like uh, post translation modifications, right? Like a, a yeah. protein can be modified and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like in general, when you correlate like mRNA expression versus proteomic data, like you don't see the, the, the line that you would expect because it'd be more of a cloud. So there's like a ton of biases everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> 
this figure shows different kinds of analysis they used for the imaging data. Uh, figure A here shows uh, imaging mass cytometry data of uh, breast cancer biopsies. This is also publicly available data set, uh, along with the cell type annotations. So they take this data set with the cell type annotations and perform Ripley's uh, uh, F statistic. Uh, so Ripley's, uh, Ripley's function quantifies how dispersed or random or clustered are cell types of same are cells of same type at different distances in a given data set. So here, this gray line is a baseline uh, obtained from this function. So with this graph, they show uh, cells belonging to this blue cluster are more clustered versus other cell types which are more dispersed or random. Like you can see that in the image. Like these blue cells are more clustered versus these are the cell types. They're more random and across the image. Uh, figure C here shows co-occurrence uh, score. So co-occurrence score quantifies uh, if a cell type is co like if, if a cell type of interest is co-occurred with any other cell type in the data set. So if we consider if they are performing this uh, analysis on the basal CK tumor cell. Here, this bluish cell type in the data set. When they perform this analysis, they see that this brown cell uh, cluster is more uh, positive for co occurrence with uh, uh, this bluish cell type, and this brown one is this elongated stroma cells. That's what you see here. Like, with these blue cell types, you always see these brown cell types co-occurring. <coughs> and figure D shows neighborhood enrichment analysis. Uh, this analysis quantifies the proximity between cell types by using the sum of nodes that belong to both cell types, like uh, once they have uh, the annotations for nodes or spots or cells, whatever it is, they perform like uh, the boundary of, like the nodes that are falling on the boundary of those clusters. Like how many of those nodes are, of a, how many of those nodes between two clusters are in close proximity, like on the boundaries? So This one is a bit confusing compared to C. It's like the main conclusion in C was that the light blue and the brown are close, right? Mm -hmm. Now in D. Oh, I don't think if it's close or if they're saying that if cell type, this uh, blue cell type, if blue cell type uh, is present in the data set, there's more uh, probability that this brown cell type also occurs. Okay. Because in D, you look at the second to last row, that's the brown one. Um, but then if you look at the middle column, that's a light blue. Yeah. Um, so if you look at that cell in that heat map, it's kind of dark. Um, like I'll annotate it. Yeah, so this is not about the spatial uh, co-occurrence, but if that cell type exists, will the other cell type exist or not in that data set. Mm -hmm. But this plot here in B shows if a cell type A exists, will the cell type B exist in the close proximity of that cell type A? So they say that like these cell types all occur in, this, in the same spatial proximity. So I think it's all these cells versus these tumor cells that are blue, pinkish data cells. And figure E shows uh, 
different networks and priority schools of uh, cell types. So these different things are like average clustering. Uh, so I, I feel like figure E is more confusing with other uh, analysis here. They say that average, uh, okay. average clustering is a measure of degree to which nodes cluster together. And closeness centrality is measure of how close the group is to other nodes. And degree centrality is fraction of non-group members connected to group members. It feels like uh, this analysis in D is further broken down into these three different types. And they say like uh, the second and third column in figure E show a clear distinction of clusters, uh, cell type blue versus others. This figure here shows how split pipe performs on uh, spatial transcriptomic data. And here we see a mouse brain um, green data set. Uh, so A, B, and C show shows uh, split by identified top spatial spatially variable genes MOPP, NRG, and KRT18 with uh, these two different uh, statistics or analysis they use from the gene expression data. And these are the clusters they obtained from the gene expression data and they see uh, So MOBP is closely related to this cluster fiber tract here. And also hypothalamus. And then NRGN is closely associated with pyramidal layers clusters orange and green and KRT18 with the lateral ventricle cluster. Nice adaptations you made. Yeah, like I couldn't, how many times ever I went back to that figure and see, I couldn't remember those, so this was easy. And this is another analysis module they have. Uh, so it shows the application of spread omics data uh, using the began receptor uh, analysis or interaction pathway analysis. Like it extracts uh, different pathways that can be exhibited between cell types. So they use. They use this a method called cell phone DP uh, uh, to extract these different pathways between the hippocampus and the pyramidal layers from the previous from the data set that I showed in the previous video from the previous data set. So this method uh, takes in the different. Uh, they show they did this analysis using the Visium data, but I wasn't sure. I was. I wasn't completely sure how that was done, but uh, when I looked deeply into the cell phone DB method, it's uh, they say that they take the single single cell data with the cell type annotations and uh, they extract all combinations of ligand receptor pairs for any given two cell types and. Then they compute the average expression of each receptor and ligand uh, types that they extracted per uh, cell type pair, per uh, cell pairs, like. And So they compute the mean of the receptor expression level of all the cells in that cluster and the uh, mean of the ligand expression level of cells uh, in, uh, in the second cluster. And those, the average of those means is used to compute this null distribution among all the cell, uh, cell pairs in the given data set. 
and then uh, if uh, if the absorbed mean of a given uh, ligand receptor is in the top five percent of this null distribution, then that interaction that ligand receptor pair is given a value of p value of zero point zero five. And they compute the p-values of all ligand receptor uh, pairs or interactions for every given cell pair in the data set. And they assume that uh, the ligand receptor uh, pair that has least number of highest, uh, least number of significant p-values are biologically relevant to that data set. Once they compute the different types of interactions, they get these interaction like the interaction names or the pathway names using the open source uh, repository that's called only bay only part database. They have uh, the different types of interactions or they can uh, receptor pair that can that can occur between any given two cell types. That's how they extracted all these different pairs. And they show only the, which they think are the significant between these two. The interaction occurring from hippocampus to these two pairs. They also do this co-occurrence measure on the Visium data set. So this analysis is also on this Visium data set. And this analysis also uh, on the same Visium data set. So uh, here they see like when they compute the co-occurrence scores of hippocampus, they see hippocampus is colored in uh, orange. So, yeah, so the pink one here is hippocampus and they see this orange and green, green clusters co-occur with hippocampus. Mm. This orange and green pyramidal layer occur with this pink cluster. And they show like these are the different clusters obtained from the gene expression data, and these are the different clusters obtained just from the image features they extracted from the Visium data. Uh, and they, these are the different clusters obtained using a deep learning algorithm called ResNet. And they claim that the clusters they obtained using the image features show more information or has more information and correct clusters compared to the gene expression clusters than this deep learning model. And And seeing what is happening in the fraction of nuclei per spot, like it's number of nuclei yeah. per spot. Okay. So I'm noticing that I get some really low numbers. I guess how does that work? Like it's, it's about like overall nuclei. Like a, a spot has a 55 micrometer diameter, I think. Um, and so on the image side. They might say like this spot, like twenty percent of it is covered by. Nucleus. Oh, okay. Makes sense. So, like, I mean, here's a proportion, I think. Right. So, like, yeah. between five percent and twenty-five percent of the spot is covered. Hmm. I mean, I guess their scale starts at zero. They show that these different layers are significantly different using this uh, image feature they extracted, like this thing. These five clusters. Mm. They should like it seems like this cluster here is more different than other clusters. So I think they should have done that analysis instead of using these clusters. Right? Mm. 
they're just trying to show that you can get data from the image and data from the gene expression and then how you can use those. I think that, that's a good example there. I was thinking like that they were telling that they can obtain the same clusters using the image features alone. Or would it, would it give more weight if it was added to the gene expression? So we thought like these were the different things that we might be interested for our experiments in house. And this software allows for integration of other softwares, as I mentioned before. So it integrates Tangram and performs cell deconvolution sorry, spot deconvolution. So it extracts number of nucleate per spots and gives it to the Tangram uh, module that they integrate and it performs this spot deconvolution. Like each dot here is no more a spot but a cell. And it's with the, and the color showing its cell type. They didn't show anything code-wise like how this happens, but they just say like they integrated Tangram and used that. Functions. And this could be another analysis for these different projects uh, to extract like different pathways or cell type interactions that's occurring in nucleus accumbens. And these are different interaction pathways that's occurring in hippo hippocampus. So just thought we could use their ligand receptor analysis to extract these interactions or pathways. And they claim that they use the actual high resolution museum image to in their interactive visualization. So instead of like the low res, high res images that we obtained from space picture that we have been using in spatial analogy. I'm not even sure like how could they load that and how fast it would be because these images, the raw images are in the order of like two to four gigahertz, gigahertz, so. Yeah, they mentioned on the methods that they like use tiles for loading images. So but like, how about the visualization? Like for processing, if it's, if they are like splitting them into tiles, it's fine. But how about the visualization? It should all be loaded. I don't know if it loads dynamically like different um, tiles or. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, they also say that they use base place clustering. I don't know if base place clustering is available in Python or not. And they didn't even show like how they integrated base place, if it's only available in R and how they integrated in Python. But these are other clustering methods that they have. Different computational needs. And they say that they are better than JOT2. And I think we will want to explore more of this uh, image processing techniques that they have to extract features and combine with gene expression matrix. Yes. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you very much. Um,